Now, British politics has been stuck in a Brexit rut for three years now. Looks like it could be longer, and the national frustration is palpable. But popular discontent is not confined to dear old Brexit blighty. In Germany, the mainstream parties that have formed and governed the Federal Republic since it was founded are in retreat and insurgents on the left and right on the rise. In America, the Republican Party has already been subjected to a hostile takeover by Donald J. Trump and family. Now, the Democratic Party establishment is under attack from a new generation of young, radical, ethnically diverse, left-wingers. Two years ago, Emmanuel Macron thought he was the future for France. Now he has to deal with the gilets jaunes trying to set central Paris on fire every Saturday afternoon. Populist insurgents have just won the most votes in Dutch elections. They're already in power in Rome. So far, it's the populists on the right that have made most of the running. But from momentum here to the new breed of politicians not afraid to call them socialist in America, there's also a new left on the rise, often recycling old ideas for today. Dutch historian Rutger Bregman recently made his mark at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Here is his take of the week. years ago, it would have been unimaginable for some random Dutch historian like me to go viral with a speech about taxes, taxes, taxes. And yet here we are. I'm part of a much wider movement of people, often young people, who realize that we need a massive transformation of our economy. What is so exciting about this moment is that suddenly ideas are being discussed that only a couple of years ago were dismissed as unreasonable and unrealistic and impossible, but now are moving into the mainstream. So to give you an example, a couple of years ago I wrote a book called Utopia for Realists, and one of the ideas in the book is the idea of a universal basic income to completely eradicate poverty. Five years ago, almost no one knew what it was. Now, people around the globe are discussing it. And the most important thing to realize is that, especially in this era of climate change, you can't afford to be a moderate anymore. You can't afford to be a centrist, right? because the changes that are required are so massive, so radical, has never been done before during peacetime. What we need to change about the current economic system. A bit of tinkering around the edges just won't do it. And that's not about being either right-wing or a leftist, it's about being a realist. The timeline is being set by science. We need to do it now. And then when we talk about the most pressing issue of today in this country, Brexit, we know that there are all these right-wing think tanks who have their own plan, right? They basically want to make this country into a paradise for billionaires. What we need to do is come up with an alternative vision right now, not just be against things that you don't like, but have a vision of how Brexit could actually be a positive thing, how we could transform this country in one of the best places on earth. And our thanks to God's own junkyard in Walthamstow. Walthamstow. Welcome, Rutger. I'm glad. Hope you enjoyed your trip there. <laughs> Great to be here. Uh, so, uh, Alan, your kind of centrism is now passe. Yeah, I don't understand the bit about moderation uh, because moderation isn't picking some stodgy idea from the middle. Moderation is about listening to other points of view and proceeding through. Uh, a democratic basis. I mean, Beveridge was a moderate. He mm -hmm. transformed this country liberal. through the welfare state. Butler was a moderate. The Education Act transformed our society. So I don't think it's about being militant or moderate. And actually, I thought one of the issues about there, uh, about the European Union, about us, uh, which Michael probably agreed with, you know, we can set our own agenda and all that. One of the problems you referred to was climate change. And it's one of those issues where no country can deal with it on their own, where international cooperation is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. So leaving the European Union doesn't advance that 
one inch. So I think you're right about, I mean, the, your idea about universal income mm -hmm. isn't new. It was published in 1503 in a book called Utopia. Oh, you don't have to tell me. And, and it's not worked story. very well in, uh, in, in Finland at the moment, but it's an idea worth exploring. It's great to have these ideas, but you can't just say on the left, it's great young people having new ideas. And... Uh, and suggest that it's just kind of on the left, because on the left, actually, all I see mainly is old ideas being mm. recycled. Rector? Well, it's true that some of these ideas are old, right? Uh, think about much higher top marginal tax rates for the very rich, which are favored by the vast majority of people in this country and elsewhere for decades, uh, are now, uh, I mean, I think that five, ten years ago, it would have, you know, people would have dismissed the idea of talking about higher taxes, and now it's become much yeah, more because popular. because of the banking crisis. Yeah, obviously. Just, Michael, what's obviously. your reaction? Yeah. I didn't know that uh, basic income had been discussed since the 16th century, but it's certainly been discussed all the time that I've been in politics, which is quite well, a long Milton time. Milton Friedman mm -hmm. floated the idea Which the is 1960s. quite a long time, and it's not gone, got anywhere uh, in that time. Uh, climate change, for a lot of people who are worried about climate change, but there's absolutely no sign in any of the developed economies that they're interested in taking uh, radical uh, measures. Uh, and as far as the attack at the end on the right wing who want a paradise for billionaires, uh, I thought that was complete fooey. I mean, actually, the people on the right wing have been talking rather idealistically about abolishing tariffs and trading freely with the world. So I thought it was a pretty ill-informed film, I'm afraid. <laughs> OK. Um, well, where to begin? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning. Yeah. Um, I think that what's really exciting about this moment, right, is that we're suddenly discussing ideas once again. That just not very long ago were being dismissed as unreasonable, unrealistic, etc. So you see many things happening at the same time. The, the Greta Thunberg phenomenon, you know, kids around the globe going on strike and not going to school. Uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, the, the great congresswoman in the US suddenly talking about new ideas, uh, really with a bold forward vision. Um, basically, I mean, your generation did nothing about climate change, or almost nothing. And now there's a, there's a young generation that realizes that we need to actually start doing something, come up with something like a Green New Deal, and just in a couple of decades, like 10, 20 years, move towards a zero emissions economy, right? So that's what I mean by just tinkering around the edges, just won't do it. But is it really a, a new idea or a good idea uh, to, to return to marginal rates of tax, 90%, or so on, uh, that almost nobody ever paid. Well, that was the point. It was the point that you had a maximum salary, right? So in the 50s and the 60s, both in the US and in the UK, you had top marginal tax rates of like 80, 90%. 98. In, the, in the golden age of capitalism, by the way, with the highest growth, growth rates and it the most post, innovation. It was a post-war boom. Um, sure, uh, but it worked fine with high taxes. And then the interesting well, thing is that well, actually the point work? was why that not many people fine? paid it because it worked but, as a maximum but, salary. So what's the right? point of a tax rate that not many people pay? Well, it works as a maximum salary. It just becomes pointless to give people a higher salary if, if they have to give 90% to the tax men, right? But they, did, but, they never, but they never did give 90% to the tax man. Exactly. The, the effective rate uh, for those in the top tax bracket uh, in America was under 40 percent. Sure, but then so you still have to agree point? that even average tax rates were much higher back then. And I mean, there's there's a clear but causal factor between inequality spiraling out of control and mm -hmm. tax rates around the globe going down, down, down. But even the when these tax yeah. rates were that high, though nobody paid them, the amount taken in income tax paid by the rich was lower than the mm -hmm. amount they pay now. Yeah, and that's an old trick. You know, that's basically because we live in such an incredibly unequal countries, especially in the US. And that's sure, then relatively, they, they pay more in tax than the poor. But the poor, yeah, the poor just haven't, haven't much to give here. Uh, but you must agree, right, that inequality has gone through the roof. No, and that must have been something. Michael? Well, no, that's simply not true. Inequality in this country is less than it has been. Well, actually, um, since more the people Thatcher are in work years, than ever before. No, Unemployment is lower than, than it well, ever has been. This is just completely fact-free. Since the Thatcher years, inequality has grown a lot. The, oh. If you look at, like, say, the Gini index, sure, there hasn't been much of a change in the past 20 years. But if you look yeah, at top there's shares, been, there's been an improvement. Like the, the rigorous best been an economic in research from from best. And, economic. and then if you go globally, of course, I mean, there's been the emergence of you know an immense middle class in China, an immense middle class in India. There's much more equality globally than there ever was before. And that's been achieved by uh, policies that have been friendly towards enterprise. Uh, yeah, by uh, China. <laughs> well, no, I mean, the policies that you advocate have been 
tested in places like Venezuela and look oh, at the absolute rubbish that has come this out. This is that just doesn't work with my generation anymore. You know, well, it doesn't um, matter whether it I was, works. I was it born in, it's in, true or wait not. a minute. I was born in 1988, so with this a year uh, before the fall. You keep going about how world. young you are, but that's not that's not an excuse for no, ignorance. But th this what has happened in Venezuela is a country has been destroyed. The poor have been destroyed. Millions of people have left the country. Yeah. Watch the television or, or, or watch your screen. Right, right. Look at your mobile phone. Okay, let nobody well, against the point. I'm not talking point. about communism. I'm talking about common sense, right? No, you're talking about So you, we had all these policies, like much higher tax rates in, in, in capitalist economies, right? In the golden age of capitalism. Universal basic income is actually, in many ways, you could see it as a right-wing idea. It's about giving people some venture capital to move to a different job, start a new company, you know, invest in their lives. I think it would be the crowning achievement of capitalism, actually. The, 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 so this, this is... It's just so boring. This there are, there are still, capitalism there are still socialism. inequalities. There's we don't huge. live in the 70s anymore, there's, right? Yeah, Get huge. on with it. Well, that's, that's entirely my point. We don't live in the 70s anymore. What you're yeah, advocating was tried in I the think 70s, just, it's failed just in the 70s. Let me hear from there's, there's huge health inequalities mm -hmm. for a start, which we can mm -hmm. now measure and need to be overcome. The problem is you mentioned that uh, school kids demonstration over Friday. I saw the banners, socialist worker banners, change the system, not the climate. Uh, so, in a sense, it goes right back to Attlee, who was also a moderate, mm -hmm. who said that the argument is not between left and right, this was in the 1930s, mm -hmm. it's between democratic and totalitarian forms of government. And that's still the case, because most of these ideas being put forward are being put forward as part of a plan that this system's rubbish, parliamentary democracy is bourgeois democracy. God, I've been listening to that since mm -hmm. the 1950s. It's nothing new, and it's just as wrong now as it's always been. Mm -hmm. Well, you must agree with me, right, that when we talk about a huge challenge like climate change, that not much has been done in the past couple of decades. That's well, uh, enormous amount has been done. So we were the first government to sign up. Labour government, Ed Miliband was the environment secretary. CO2 to, emissions have collapsed. To zero so, I mean, uh, carbon trading. The coal trading. industry has been abolished in this country. Carbon but trading was an enormous I mean, if you, step I forward. I mean, if you want to demonstrate against uh, climate change, it's, it shouldn't be in Parliament Square, it should be outside the Chinese Embassy. They're opening a new coal fire mm -hmm. station yeah, yeah, every absolutely. week. I think we've, that's we've, also we've, a we're closed. We've, yeah. we've, it's, it's not a trick, it's a fact. Yeah. We've closed yeah. Yeah. every coal fire every station is a trick. in this country. Uh, <laughs> no. it, it has either been closed or is about to be closed. China is building a station every week of the dirtiest, most polluting kind of energy generation. Sure. So go Just to the as Chinese. we have been doing, you know, when we Chinese were developing, in, right? So that's yeah, but a we natural stopped. development cycle, I think. Yeah, but nobody um, knew about the CO2 threat in these I days. think it's a responsibility. Okay, so you're going to, so you're going to allow richest... natural development cycles, are you? Well, no, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm so just talking about so, the So there's no radical change there, is there? Of the richest so, countries So what you're saying is China can build lots and lots of coal stations because it's a natural development cycle. Thank God you haven't called for a second referendum. The first person to sit on that sofa for several weeks who hasn't. Well, give him time. You can talk to to, to that. Uh, I think Rutgers probably in favour of us leaving the European Union. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are you? You've been such yeah, a pain in the ass for yeah, such yeah. a long time. <laughs> I think we can now finally build a proper union. You know? The guy's on your side. He's on <laughs> your well, side. We've got a point um, of agreement. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Even though well, I do think um, that, you know, it is quite depressing, this whole Brexit business, right? Mm -hmm. But now I think that especially people on the left or progressive, progressive need to come up with some kind of positive vision, how it could actually be a good thing, right? And that it won't be this paradise for billionaires. But you, yeah. you're, uh, I think your formula for a successful post-Brexit Britain would be 90% marginal rates on income tax, a large wealth tax, and a bigger inheritance tax. Uh, will that really have the best and the brightest coming to our shores? Well, I think so, yeah. Really? I think so. What, what the, the issue is now is that there are so many people at the so called at the top of the the economy, right? The so-called wealth creators. But if you actually look at what they're doing, they're not really creating wealth, right? We're talking about corporate lawyers, bankers, consultants, and and you give them a beer or maybe two, and at the end of the day, they'll admit that their job is absolutely meaningless and they don't, don't add anything of value. So if they go on strike, no one cares, right? But nothing much happened. In, in my like book, it. I've got one example of, of bankers going on strike. It's the only well, it was way strike back that ever happened in 1970 in Ireland. You indeed. wouldn't want the ATMs to go on strike. No. Well, um, the strike lasted for <laughs> six months and nothing much happened. Right? Let me ask you this so final question. So that's the real question I think we should ask. Because it's, 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 it's interesting you know, to see 
we can hardly say we're not needing some new ideas mm -hmm. or even recycling old ideas to try again. But if these ideas are on the march now, who other than the sort of left of the Democrats in America is uh, adopting them? Well, it's happening around the globe, isn't it? Give me a part. Jeremy Corbyn. Well, parties are always at the end, right? It's, it always starts at the fringes with people who are first dismissed as crazy, ridiculous, irrelevant. Just five years ago, when I was giving my first talks about basic income, and I know it's an old idea, but it was also quite forgotten, right? Um, no, it was never. And I was given, given talks for small groups of anarchists, right? With long hair, a bit smelly. Uh, now it's being discussed around the globe. You know, I was invited to Davos, of all places, to talk about it. So uh, people what had didn't you done expect to deserve that. that. <laughs> well, write a book about it. And, and there are many, many people who are worried about the threat of automation, right? Robots taking our jobs. And here, here again, basic income seems a sensible idea. Just want to remind right. you that employment has never been higher in this country. Unemployment's never been higher. I, I just need to remind you all that we've run out of time, but uh, Rucker Bregman, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.